Let's open our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1 as we're making our way through the book of Acts. Um, Rich, rich passages of scripture that uh, it, it benefits us to camp in for a few moments. That's what we're going to do this morning from Acts chapter 6 beginning in verse 1 through verse 7. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and, and will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the word. Well, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands this morning, but how many of you ladies have a housekeeper that comes to your house? Uh, maybe once a week or occasionally they come and you have them clean your house. All right? How many of you who have a housekeeper come from time to time clean your house before the housekeeper comes? <laughs> because, you know, there are just some things that we don't want anybody seeing, not even the housekeeper. We know it would be very easy for the Holy Spirit and Dr. Luke, the human author of the book of Acts, to... To, uh, to leave this portion, this episode out of the account of the book of Acts. Because the church, as powerful as it is here in the book of Acts, doesn't have it all together completely. That it doesn't get everything right. It says in verse 1 that in those days the number of disciples was increasing. And so we know that the church is moving forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. People are being saved. Disciples are being made. And yet it's not a perfect church. And no church is. Every church has challenges. Every church has problems. And, uh, and it would be very easy for the, the, the Holy Spirit and for Dr. Luke to have left this out in the, in the attempt to try to portray a perfect church. But that, I'm grateful that we see the church, warts and all, and how they work through their challenges and encouraging us as we work through our challenges as, as a church. But the thing that allowed them to remain unstoppable in their ministry was that they kept their focus on their biblical priorities. You see, it's very easy to lose sight of our priorities. And one of the things that Satan wants to do, and his attacks are unrelenting here in the book of Acts, in trying to stop the ministry of the church. The first way he does that is he tries to defeat the church through persecution. Remember in Acts chapter 4 and 5, the apostles, the leaders of the church are arrested, thrown into jail, they're beaten, instructed that they're not to teach and preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Of course, they ignore that. But this is just Satan's attempt to defeat the church by persecution. By the way, in our, in our evening of prayer and praise tonight, we're going to spend time praying specifically for the persecuted church around the world. Uh, maybe you've heard the news about the 21 Coptic Christians. These are Egyptian believers who were beheaded by ISIS in Libya. Well, this is just one instance of persecution that's happening all over the world. And so uh, we need to pray for the persecuted church. But if Satan can't defeat the church by persecution, he will try to corrupt the church by impurity and hypocrisy. And that's what we see happening in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira and their deception, trying to deceive the Holy Spirit and to deceive the church and the apostles. Well, the Lord dealt very severely with them, didn't he? They died for that. But then again, it was an attempt of Satan to corrupt the church through hypocrisy and impurity. But if he can't defeat the church through persecution and he can't corrupt the church through hypocrisy and impurity, he will try to distract the church 
by misplaced priorities. And that's what we have happening here in Acts chapter 6 because the apostles have been given by the Lord Jesus Christ the responsibility to teach the truth and to proclaim the word and the gospel. And, and for them to neglect that ministry would leave the church vulnerable to false teachers. The church and all these thousands of new believers could not be established in their faith and the efforts to expand the gospel to the nations would, would be stopped. On top of that, remember that Jesus had told the disciples, he said, I want you to love each other the way I have loved you. So you love each other and care for each other. But if they fail to do this, if that, if that, if that didn't happen in the body, then, then it would, it would uh, distort the message of the gospel that was being proclaimed. So, Jerusalem, we have a problem. And that's what we see in verse 1. We see the problem. It says in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So there are cultural differences in the church. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I love that about our church, the cultural differences. As I look around this room, I see different colored faces. I know that under this roof today, there are different languages being spoken, not in this room, but in other places on our campus this very moment. I love the fact that there are young and old. And so they're, 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 uh, there are, there's this diversity in the church. And it was true in spite of the fact that most of those early Christians came from a Jewish background. Isn't that interesting today that when we think about people who are most resistant to the gospel, it would have to be people from, from the Jewish nation that are very hard to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here, in the very beginning of the church, most of these new believers are coming from a Jewish background. But in spite of that, that, that they've been saved and uh, that, that they come from different cultural distinctions. Some of them uh, came from Greek-speaking regions. And some of them came from Hebrew-speaking regions like Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee and the other areas there nearby. But they're all now saved, and by the Spirit of God, they're one body, but they, have, they still have these cultural distinctions. Now, we're not sure if it was just uh, intentional neglect or if it was just an oversight that, that for whatever reason, these Grecian widows who had, who had great needs were overlooked in the, uh, in the distribution of food. Um, and we learned earlier that there was something very sweet happening in the church. Whenever there was a need, people would sell stuff and bring the money to the apostles, and they would distribute it to meet those needs. But apparently, the system breaks down. Even the apostles' programs don't always work properly. And so, and so the system breaks down, and, um, and so the apostles, under the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, come up with a solution. There's a problem, then the solution in verse 2 so the, the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now it sounds to me like someone came up with the bright idea, hey, let's just tell the apostles to fix this. Let's just, let's just let the apostles work a little harder and figure this out, meet this need. But the apostles recognized the danger of that. Because they had already been given the assignment to proclaim and to teach the word of God. That was their calling. That was their ministry. That was their, their responsibility. And now the apostles are not saying, listen, we're too good to wait on tables. We're too good to do this. Get somebody else. No. They're saying, listen, what we have to do is so vital and so important to the church that if we're to take on something else, it would cause us to not be as effective in ministering the word of God uh, as we should. So to solve the problem, they uh, look at verse 3. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who, you, who are known to, to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So what is happening here is that the apostles are putting in place a pattern that is going to be replicated in churches all over the world as the gospel expands and churches are planted. 
So the, the apostles are serving in the role of pastoral leaders in the church in Jerusalem. But as, as the churches are, are, are planted around the nations, the pastoral leaders are, are, uh, become a distinct office. But also the apostles here are putting into place another office. These men, these men that are going to be chosen here are not called deacons here in Acts chapter 6, but they are called deacons later in the New Testament. And so what we see happening here is that these seven men, along with the 12 apostles, are making up two important offices in the church. So, for example, when the gospel spreads to Europe and makes its way to Macedonia to a city called Philippi, when the apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi, he addresses them in this way in Philippians 1.1. He said, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. So he's identifying there that there were two offices in place. There's the overseer, also called the pastor or the elder, and there is the, the, the deacon, uh, these uh, men who were chosen to serve as serving leaders two offices. So verse 5 says that this proposal pleased the whole group and they chose these seven men. Now this is not apparent from reading just the English version of this, but actually all seven of these names are Greek names. They are uh, names that, um, that indicate that the church saw the wisdom of, of choosing men who understood the needs of, of the whole body, but particularly the group that had the, the issue, the, the Greek-speaking widows. And so there is this beautiful thing that is happening here. And verse 6 says that uh, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the pattern of testing and selecting and qualifying and setting apart men for the office of deacon is put in place here. This is, re this is repeated in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So we have not only in 1 Peter 3 the qualifications for the first office, the office of pastor, but we have the qualifications for the other office, the office of deacon. And, and I'm, I'm very happy to say that the process that our church uses in selecting deacons comes right out of this out of the teaching of God's word here in Acts chapter 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. So there's a problem, there's a solution, and then there are the results. Look at verse 7. It says that the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So what happens here is that Satan's attack is unsuccessful, and the ministry of the church remains unstoppable. It's beautiful how this passage begins with the words that the, in those days the number of disciples was increasing. And so they go through this time of testing and this challenge in ministry where things didn't work exactly the way they should. So they made some corrections and they come to the end of it. And what happens is in verse 7 is that the word of God spread as a result of this. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased what? rapidly not just increase but increase rapidly and in fact it says that a large number of priests were saved it became obedient to the faith priests jewish priests who before were involved in persecuting the, the the apostles many of them who would be most resistant to the gospel are now saved and you see this is a wonderful thing that happens when the church remains true to its biblical priorities the word of God is preached and taught, and the needs of people are met. Now, I want to close with three points of application for all of us. Now, it would be very easy for you to come and say, well, this, this doesn't apply to me. I need to tune out here and I'm think about the weather or something else. But actually, this applies to all of us. This is very important for all of us. Three points of application. The first one has to do with the importance of ministry in the church. The importance of ministry in the church. Just reading this passage, we see how vital ministry is to the church. For instance, in verse 1, where it talks about this daily distribution of food. That word distribution in verse, in verse 1 has, uh, is the word that is translated ministry in other places. It's also the word from which we get our word deacon. 
words. It's just a general word for ministry. And when you come to verse 2 and it talks about the, um, the serving of, or waiting on tables, that, that word serving literally means ministry, the ministry of tables. It's the same word. And you come down to verse 4 and the apostle's talking about the ministry of, of, of the word. It's the same word that is used in all these other places. And so we get the idea here that ministry is important. So there's the ministry of the 12, there's a ministry of the 7, and beyond that there's all kinds of ministries going on in the life of the church. Why? Because their hearts beat with the, with the heartbeat of Jesus. The one who said in Matthew 20, 28, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why ministry has such a high priority in the life of our church and any New Testament church. People who are filled with the spirit of Jesus will, will want to serve. And Peter would talk about this in 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. He said, each one should use whatever gift he has. Each one, whatever gift you have, is to, be, is to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. I just, there's so much in this verse I, 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 that we could talk about today, but just think about this. God's grace comes to us when we need strengthening. Do you realize that God's grace flows through the ministry of other people? That's what it says here in this verse. As, as we use our gifts that we've received to serve others God's grace in its various form flows through us to help other people. Maybe you don't realize that, that when you are serving, you are a minister of God's grace to other people. You know, we tend to put the spotlight on people, don't we, that have upfront ministries and that are um, more visible. And yet there are many, many ministries that go on in the life of the church that no one ever sees that are vitally important. Those of you who are basketball fans uh, probably know that a legendary basketball coach by the name of Dean Smith died a few weeks ago. He was legendary because he was a, he was a trendsetter in, in basketball circles. For instance, uh, if, if you've ever watched a basketball game, someone makes a basket and they turn to, 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 to run up the court and you'll see that they're pointing to, a, uh, they're pointing to another player up there. And, and what's happening there is that they're pointing to the assist man. They're pointing to the assist man. And that's what Dean, Dean Smith actually started that practice. He said, listen, guys, point to the assist man. Give some recognition to the guy who saw that you had an open shot, passed the ball to you, and you made it. You would have never got that shot had not the assist man seen you open. And so that's so important in the life of the church. We need to point to the assist people, the people who are assisting us in service in so many ways and, and appreciate them and honor them for the role that they have, even if their responsibility is not seen by other people. There are hundreds of roles in the ministry of the church that all, of, all help us keep our priority on, on the, um, the proclamation of the word and caring for the needs of people. But the second point of application is this, not just the importance of ministry, but also the distinctions of ministry in the church. The distinctions of ministry in the church. Now, none of us are superheroes. Now, uh, those of us who are grandparents uh, know about superheroes, all right? Because our grandkids play with them. And maybe some of you are fans of the Marvel superheroes back from the real day when you read them in comic books. But... Uh, even the superheroes work together as team, as a team. Now, your, your favorite superhero may be the Hulk. Or maybe your superhero, favorite superhero is, uh, is, is Black Widow or Captain America or, or Iron Man. Uh, but, but the fact is that, that they, there's a big bunch of them, and I've just, I lose track of how many superheroes. Every, every time I turn around, there's a new movie coming out about one I've never heard of before. But... But they work together as a team. Why? Because they all have different strengths and weaknesses. For instance, if you know, what about Hulk? What is, his, what is his way of dealing with everything? You smash it. That's his way of dealing with everything. Captain America is not the biggest, maybe not the strongest of the superheroes, but he's, he's the leader. He's a natural leader, and everybody follows him. The Iron, Iron Man, 
He's, he's, he's got the tech thing going on. He's got every gadget you can imagine, and he knows how to work them. So you can see that, that in the body of Christ, there are all kind, there's just diversity in the life of the church. We all have different strengths and weaknesses, and it takes all of us. None of us are superheroes, and so we should, we should understand and find out what our unique gift is and use that. And here in Acts chapter 6, there's a distinction of two different gifts. There's the distinction of the, the ministry of the pastoral leaders, the apostles, and, and the preaching and the leading uh, that comes through the word of God. And then there's the, the ministry of the seven, the deacons, who, who are serving leaders in the church, who, who, who set the pace for people to serve and minister in the body of Christ to meet the needs of other people. The pastoral leaders are called to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says it was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to do the work of ministry. No, it says to prepare God's people for works of service or ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. And so all of God's people, you notice there, are to be engaged in service, all of us. Find our gifts and use them to build up the body of Christ. And our deacons are men who do this. You know, some churches have a deacon board or a board of deacons that run the church. I'm so thankful because that's, that's not the way the Holy Spirit designed this office. And I'm thankful that our church understood that generations and generations ago. Our deacons are a, a body of servants, not a board of directors. They're involved in ministry. I wish you could sit in on our deacons meeting last last uh, Sunday afternoon to hear our deacon chairman talk about leading someone to Christ and hearing, hearing them pray together about the needs of people in the life of our church. And I'm grateful that that has been the heritage of our church, that deacons who are serving leaders whose main concern are the needs of people. But then beyond that, there's all kinds of diversity in our church, all kinds of ways that we are involved. And the important thing is for you to find your place of ministry and then glorify God and build up the church in that place. The third point of application has to do with the empowering for ministry in the church. The empowering for ministry. And so it says here in verse 3 that these men who are to be set apart were to be men known to be full of the Holy Spirit. I love that. You know when someone is full of the Holy Spirit and you know when someone is full of themselves, don't you? Look for men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and because of that, they have great wisdom. I respect people like that. I need people like that. He said, look for them. And, uh, and so that, that is necessary for ministry. It's necessary for the pastoral leaders, for the apostles to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We see that all the way through the first parts of the book of Acts. And in verse 4 it says, the apostle says, we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Because they understood that for the church to be unstoppable, to move along in the power of the Holy Spirit, it will come as a result of prayer and the ministry of the word. Now what if I were to walk among us today and just ask you individually, stand up and tell me what your ministry is. One by one, you would stand. And someone would say, I work with preschoolers. The next person, well, I work with the tech ministry of the church. Or the next person, I help with uh, driving vans for kids. Or I help sing in the choir. Or I help pass out uh, worship guides, or I help greet people, or I help park cars. If I were to go right down the row and ask you to stand and tell me, what is your ministry? Could you do it? Could you do it? And not all of it all happens right here under this, under this roof. For some of you, you, you're involved in a ministry where you live, in the, uh, in the apartment complex where you live, or in your neighborhood, or volunteering with some organization out. But could you say, this is my ministry? I want to challenge you, friends, to find it and pour yourself into it in the power of the Holy Spirit and let God be glorified where you serve. Let's pray. Father, I... I thank you just for how we can open your word and, 
and see the beauty of how you've designed and created your church to function. And Lord, I, I pray that you would call more and more of us out into meaningful ministry in different ways. And Lord, in, in doing that, I pray that you would, you would be glorified, that your church would be edified and strengthened, and that as a result of this, our land would be evangelized, that the, the word of God would go forth and that people would be saved. And we ask this in Jesus' name.